on this. So we are ready to go. Awesome. Oh, and Cece is with us. I am, I am. Yay, yay. Oh. Hi, Cece. Hello. Oh, you're in the cosmos. Hey. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> so we're live on Facebook. Hold on, I'm going to do this. There we go. Seems that when I change my iPad around, it's got a weird angle when I'm looking at it. There we go. Hi. <laughs> Great. Awesome. Good luck today. Awesome. Got this. We've just gone live on Facebook, so maybe if I can, um, feels like the right time I would show introductions. And um, many of you will see Alexa Petulis is up there in the top right corner of your gallery view. She's going to be our uh, leading the discussion today, but I'll just start with an acknowledgement that the Wild Bird Trust is situated on the unceded lands of Tsleil-Waututh, Squamish, and Musk Musqueam nations, and that the Wild Bird Trust is centering um, its work in, of reconciliation and activities and education, particularly with Tsleil-Waututh, given the community's proximity to the site and past and current stewardship roles. And we're grateful to be here having this conversation and taking steps towards all of our shared goals in this way. Um, Alexa Petulis is a, an accomplished leader in the space of social enterprise development and morphing existing organizations to more social, um, environmental, and culturally oriented missions. And so we've invited her here today to um, help us understand a bit more about what social enterprises are, give some examples, and then open the floor to a discussion of how that might look in the context of our Coast Salish plant nursery in the flats. So I'll hand it over to her. Great. Thank you, Erin. Thank you, everyone. Great to be here today. Um, I, um, I'm going to go and share my and share my screen and just to So bear with me here for a moment. Hmm. Maybe just a thumbs up, Leanne. Can you see that? Is that working? Yes, for I can. You? Okay, great. Okay, so uh, yeah, before I kind of dive in, I just wanted to um, mention that it's a bit harder to see the chat when I'm screen sharing. Um, so if I'm very, this is, I am not necessarily an expert in this space. This is a very new and changing space, really exciting and growing across Canada. Uh, and we do have other people that have um, lots of experience in this uh, with social enterprises in this space as well. So very happy to make this, um, you know, a conversation. So don't hesitate to, uh, you know, if you want to jump in. And I know Leanne and Aaron said that they would monitor the chat. So if there is a question or a point of clarification or something you want to add, please feel free. Maybe the best way is to put it in the chat. And then um, Aaron or Leanne, you can just interrupt me. Um, I can see both of you on my screen, so um, uh, then I can I can just pause and you can pop your mic on, and that would be great. How's that sound? Um, oh, let me just. Why? Okay, there we go. Um, so I was sort of I was asked to kind of give a bit of an overview of, about what what are social enterprises and what does the landscape and the context look like in Canada and BC. Um, I you know I don't want to you know, lecture for too long, but I do, you know, I kind of give a few over, you know, some key points for that. Uh, and as I say, and then I will, but I'm happy to share these slides afterwards. And the last page I've put together a list of resources um, that people can use and kind of go deeper on any of the points. Definitely some great examples and awesome resources out there. Uh, so this is just a bit of a flow. We'll just you know, talk about what a social enterprise is, uh, the context, a few examples, and sort of I'll speak a bit of my own experience and my own philosophy of what what and why I see such potential in um, you know what I call business business for good um, and uh, and then I've got a we've got a, a couple of dialogue questions to kind of bring it back to the uh, the wild bird trust and and the land that you are stewarding uh, and in particular the nursery project that uh, is uh, is uh, in uh, well that you're working on I guess so um, so maybe just to kind of give us all just a moment, just to take one minute in our own brains to kind of think, reflect on uh, the Wild Bird Trust, which you all know way 
better than I do, but um, thinking for a minute, maybe you can jot down a couple notes or in your, to yourself, but what role does the Wild Bird Trust play in contributing to positive environmental, social, and cultural outcomes? And I'll be quiet for a moment and think. Um, so can any of us weigh in? Is that what this? Yeah, I was just um, um, yeah, giving people a moment to think, but yeah, I'm happy to take a couple of reflections now. Go ahead, please. Okay, yeah. Um, so I feel that uh, we've already kind of been uh, practicing a, a, a small scale model of uh, how the Wild Bird Trust can uh, play a role in in, in all of these uh, elements, environmental, social, and cultural. And so it's, a, it's proven to be a great hub and location um, to bring people on the land, to look at things and to see firsthand what uh, indigenous plants, uh, the role they have in restoring, but also what the cultural and social elements are that come in. And so, I mean, that's really what has brought us to here. So I think that it's been a great instigator and a great um, springboard for looking at projects like this in all uh, environmental spaces where there is a need to remediate, restore, and return uh, stewardship back to in local indigenous communities. So I don't know, that's my two cents. <laughs> Lovely. Yeah. Well great. articulated. Thanks. <laughs> Is there anybody Happy else that wants to offer yeah. something? Great. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I might offer an observation uh, that as it's by having, by carrying the name of, or let's say the organization carrying the name of the Wild Bird Trust and having the specific um, ornithological and ecological agenda that's there, although it essentially func operates as a public park land and space. I noticed that I mean, the investment of the regular uh, users of the land, the membership, the birders who are there, there's a much more, um, there's a, a much greater sense of um, stewardship, I guess, let's say for lack of, um, among the people who are there as opposed to sort of just any given parkland. So it's kind of an interesting feature of the place that it's, it's open to everyone, it's not locked, it's free, and yet it uh, garners this kind of added input and investment from the people who are there by the people who are there. Um, and I would, I would just, I would just add from a, from a perspective of a, the board of directors, to, 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 to the letter of what you're asking, um, I would contradict my friend's comments um, and say that that's what Maplewood Flats does. But I think the organization, the Wild Bird Trust of BC, um, is doing what Cease and Aaron just explained in a kind of case study in situ with the conservation area at Maplewood Flats. But to so the question is, what role does the Wild Bird Trust play in that, those outcomes? Uh, it's, it's in a way prioritized Maplewood Flats over its provincial mandate. So in a sense, there's this, dual, there's this kind of dualism between the Wild Bird Trust publishing Wingspan and, and, and these, these visions that, that Cease and Aaron articulated. Um, how do we communicate that provincially? And how do we show that Maplewood Flats is a case study? Because there's times in our history of the organization that we actually had multiple sites. We had a conservation area at Salt Spring Island, for example. So We've let those ones go and we're, we're only focusing on Maplewood Flats and then doing that applied work that Cease and Aaron were doing in specifically on that site. Um, but we also have this, the board also is looking at what are the broader implications for the organization and the provincial mandate. So I just wanted to add that context. Oh, really interesting. Thanks for that. That's an interesting history too. Um, Okay, so I'm going to move on. We're, we're definitely going to come back to more discussion again, but that was just to kind of get us grounded in the actual, the tangible, why, what you are all here and involved in before we talk, start talking about the, the broader context. So what is a social enterprise? Um, well, the funny thing is, is there's, 
there's not actually one set definition <laughs> and, it's, uh, and, and that's the truth. And so that's the, the fun part about it. Um, you know, generally speaking, it's um, an organization that is out to achieve social, cultural or environmental aims through the sale of goods and services. So there is a business transaction. Um, but, uh, and so, you know, the, the kind of the going definition with some of the bigger uh, organizations in Canada is that it is, you know, a for-profit or a non-for-profit, but the majority of net profits are directed to a social objective. Um, with limited distribution to shareholders and owners. And so, you know, in the specifics from Buy Social Canada, we're saying that that means at least 50% of a business or organization's revenue is coming from the selling of goods and services. Um, and at least 50% of the business's profits go back into that social, cultural, or environmental mission. Um, but again, there is, social enterprise is not a defined um, thing or you know legal structure as uh in relation like as far as the canada's income tax act is concerned um and while there and there is no real official certification although by social canada does have um a bit of an accreditation program to get listed and as an official social enterprise for social procurement um yeah so that is that and i will link there are some links to videos and other resources that i'll share uh, with you afterwards. So um, to that effect, uh, so that's sort of the why it exists, um, they can be really all shapes and sizes. Uh, so nonprofits, charities, cooperatives, um, all are structures that operate um, what we call social enterprise. Um, uh, and then also corporations, so regular businesses that can, and this is an important one, so the corporations can also be owned by charities, co-ops, individuals, or groups of individuals. Um, and there is, like, there, there's a great document that I've liked that goes very deep into the structures and all the different structures and what decisions you might go with depending on the, the types of aims. And so, for example, if you know financial return is the primary goal of the venture then you're going to want to find a structure that affords greater flexibility um, in that in that regard um, uh, and then maybe just to speak a few minutes about in bc we're we're quite unique uh, we do have what's called a community contribution company that's a legal entity it's often known as a c3 um, and that in i think it was 2012 uh, that uh, the amendments were made to the, Bis the BC Business Corporation Act. So that's a very specific, specific type of, um, uh, of corporation that, uh, you know, you can, there's sort of a list of um, specifics that have to be met. For example, you know, one of the biggest one is that it, uh, there's a 40% cap on dividends um, paid out to investors, but there's also an additional layer of transparency in terms of reporting and that there is required annual reporting on what, on the sort of, have you manifested your social, cultural, or environmental goals? Um, so that's sort of the, the short things of that. In other countries, uh, there are other legal structures that have been identified. So in, in several states in the US, there is what's being called a benefit corporation. Um, and in the UK there, uh, they also do have something that looks more like a, a community contribution company and I'm sure others exist out there so all to say that um, uh, the sky's kind of the limit it's really about the nature of the work that you're doing and the why behind it can I raise a question then about the community contribute the c3 model mm -hmm. um, in that case is a who is the sort of overseeing ent body or entity in that case or is that kind of replacing an accreditation process in a way if if we if a company uh advertises themselves as a c3 company then we know that they're having to tick all the boxes without a separate accreditation process or public oversight yeah, so they would, I think it still falls under the BC Corporations Act, so you would still be an incorporated body uh, under that act, but with these sort of special 
yes, special box ticking, exactly. So in that case, my as my understanding, and Erwin, maybe please jump in if you if you know more, but it could it would be the same structure. So a chair a, a charity, for example, could own a a C3 or a, or a group of individuals, et cetera, if that makes sense. Okay, great. Um, where am I here? Oh, this is a bit of a messy slide. So yeah, business for good. This is really a growing movement um, and has been for some time. Um, it, a study in 2016 of the, landscape, the social enterprise landscape in Canada found more than 7,000 confirmed social enterprise existing that were, you know, of that about 1,350 reported over a billion dollars in revenues and providing services to over 5 million individuals. Um, the interesting part is that is there's actually a good portion of those that have been around for 15 to 20 years. So it's actually, it's, um, th this has been a, a sort of an evolution of a movement um, and in some ways uh, was a little bit slower in Canada that is definitely gaining steam now. Um, I've included the breakdown of, there's definitely social enterprises that exist across sectors, um, food and beverage, management consulting, healthcare, construction, consumer goods, um, but interesting to see where some of the bigger portions of, um, of those social enterprises fall. Um, tradition in Canada so far in the space, there's been a large percentage that are involved in employment development or training for workforce integration. So often looking like um, we have some great examples that I, I'll note later, but um, uh, in Vancouver, downtown east side, there's several social enterprises that are quite well known, like the East Bend Roasters have culinary training society, Potluck Cafe, Embers, that all have different types of programs that are geared to providing jobs and training to um, individuals that experience different varieties of barriers to, um, to, to work or traditional employment. Um, but you can see it's a, it's a real, it's a real mix. Yeah, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so this is kind of, you know, goes to, I, um, I left a career in the federal public service to go back and do an MBA in essentially business for good. It was, um, it was really focused on triple and quadruple bottom line businesses, which included the range of uh, social enterprises and different types of um, structures to basically reorient and say, you know, uh, and actually I have done a little bit of research into the root of the, where the root of the word business comes from. And I couldn't find, I couldn't find the, the, the info that I wanted to share here, but from my memory, it was, it's really around business was essentially connected to caring um, for others and that there was a real um, level of caring and sort of you were offering and if you, you can hundreds of years ago this makes sense because there was such details and craftsmanships in sort of the goods and the services that were were put out so there was a um i think the the a real original idea of where business comes from is it was a level of caring for that goods or service that you were um, offering to your, you know, customer, your client. Um, so I really see this space as an incredible opportunity for creativity and blurring the lines between nonprofit and for-profit. Um, uh, and in that so much as both in both nonprofit charity and for-profit world, we're still, um, we still see the colonial structure and ways of working um, from a paradigm that I believe we're trying to move uh, away from. Uh, and so I see this as a space because it's not, there is no official definition. It's exciting because you can actually create um, what feels um, like a good way forward for the uniqueness of the people, the land and the, the groups and the, you know, the, that you're working with. Um, the, in particular, there's a huge uh, opportunity uh, in the space of social procurement um, so just to kind of give more of a definition of what that means is that uh, it's easiest to think of in business in sort of government terms is if that you know the federal government gives out contracts for let's say cleaning of a large number of 
buildings or um, or infrastructure. Uh, and so the idea of social procurement is that there would be actual directions or policy written that um, if possible, where available, that the first go to for the bid for those services, um, goods or services would be to go with um, not just a company that is there is there for just the financial transaction or the economic value, but that one that you're getting the ripple effect of um, a social, maybe a social or environmental uh, goals as well. So it's sort of like use government funding to, you know, you know, double or triple or whatever the the um, the, the good value, um, uh, if that makes sense. Um, Alexa, and if I could, just, yeah. if I could just add a comment just for, for folks who are watching this on Facebook afterwards, um, in, in terms of the context, we're, we're actually, we're looking at not Maplewood Flats as the social enterprise, but, or the Wild Bird Trust as a social enterprise, but specifically the one particular program that we operate, which is the nursery program. So it's just for context, it's, it's um, I guess, through this iterative process that Aaron, Aaron is leading, considering all these things that you're sharing, all these beautiful op options, incredibly flexible options, how is it that a, a, a very modest nursery operation can grow and reflect the values of the, the mother organization, the Wild Bird Trust of BC? So we're not necessarily looking at business models of the Wild Bird Trust, but specific, specifically one of our programs and how it interacts with all these other pieces, these, these value pieces. That's great. Thanks, Erwin. That's really great um, uh, context uh, partway through. So, um, yeah, just and I think the final point on this slide here is just to, to speak a little bit of the idea of social return on investment. And actually, Erwin, you might um, there there is a study that's that's quite new of, around the um, social enterprise impact um, on the downtown east side for in 2019 which for when I think was a lead researcher on um, but uh, one of the points from that uh, I think describes um, sort of the, an analysis on social return for an investment quite well um, and that's sort of the idea that um, uh, uh, maybe I'm just going to read this because it's um, so there was a, the analysis on social return conducted by Ernst & Young revealed that for every dollar spent to employ a target employee group um, in 2016 at Atira Property Management, there was the savings um, made to in social assistance, local spending, social housing, criminal justice costs, health costs, food banks, and meal programs of $4.13. So, <clears throat> It just it, it's sort of sort of the it's the research and it's quite the new space again around doing figuring out the math around if we spend one dollar here um, in a way that's generating more possibilities and job opportunities and well-being for people what are the not just the benefits of that interaction action and that employment uh, interaction, but also the cost savings um, on some of the other societal programs and infrastructure um, that, that would otherwise be incurred. Erwin, do you have anything to add there? You know, I think, I think in, with regards to, you know, also uh, Don, Don Morrison, there's also an article in that report uh, where I interviewed Don Morrison and um, she talks about the regenerative economy. So recirculating wealth within the community. And I think when we're looking at communities like, for example, our, our partners at Slayototh Nation, uh, they have a beautiful program, which, which CIS is very familiar with, which is Takaya Tours. And so again, it's, it's, a, it's a cultural business. It's an employment program. It's, um, it's self-sustaining. You, know, it, it, you know, it's, yes, it's a, it's a, a a guiding and, and kayaking business, but in fact, it provides all these other returns. And if we yeah. consider the nursery also as providing these additional returns, supporting conservation, uh, bringing in revenue, it could be employment, it could be employment for particular targeted groups, i.e. slave to the community members. So in that regard, we look at conservation not as this siloed practice, but it has an economic role, it has a socioeconomic role, and that's a form of uh, advancing our restoration goals. It can be they can be culturally embedded. They can be socioeconomically embedded. Oh, great, thank you. The type of valuation. Um, I also just would speak to the um, 
that type of valuation happens often in the environmental space where we want to attribute a dollar value to actions that are taken. And I find it's often kind of a black box or a bit weird to relate to, oh, you know, putting one snowberry in your front yard translates to, you know, is the equivalent of $10 or $1,000 worth of ecosystem services. But um, this is the challenge presented for um, in this brave new world of, of business or um, exchange between people and organizations is to understand the greater benefits and tell these stories in a way that are accessible for people that aren't necessarily just dollars and cents. So maybe that's the point where we relate most, or maybe it's that it supports the lives of six birds or you know, however we're going to translate this, this work, or it's an opportunity for um, these medicinals or this uh, human interaction with the land that wasn't happening in that location previously, or um, taking, I like taking, thinking of these sort of economic relationships and thinking of how else to tell the story. Yeah, it's a really good point. And I think that the sector is definitely still trying to figure out how to, to tell the story beyond some of the traditional forms of measuring certain things around this is a this is the impact. Um, um, uh, so this is just, uh, again, I reference, this is a great report to go back to, um, very relevant, very sort of local, um, um, but just, uh, I guess, uh, there were over 75 nonprofit market-based social enterprises um, uh, identified in the downtown east side, and you can see here um, just the, the the, the real impact in, in both employment and um, and uh, dollars uh, value um, that is that is brought uh, through those. So uh, definitely I'll be, take I'll be, to go. I'll, I'll be leading that research again this year. Um, and and there are there are actually examples. Uh, and I'm glad you 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 brought this in. Um, for example, um, the uh, the honey project. Uh, what, I'm blanking on the name. The uh, uh, hives for humanity. Hives for humanity. You know, so there's another example which 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 speaks to Aaron's point. You know, and Cease's initial points that hives for humanity. One could calculate that when they place their hives and their um, uh, bee friendly pollinating pollinator gardens throughout East Vancouver, uh, and sometimes they're actually being paid to do that work. That there's these all these accrued benefits. That are separate from just the business of of selling honey. So there's, I think that's a good model for when we calculate when we're selling a plant from the nursery, it raises money, the customer is happy because um, they get a plant, but they also know that the value benefit accrues through a plant. The organization having resources now to plant a plant in for restoration goals in on site, uh, or we promote biodiversity by that customer bringing that plant home. And plan to get in Burnaby or plan to get in North Vancouver. Yeah, wonderful. Um, and so just another example that is more of a personal story and I won't take too much time but I was um, brought in by um, uh, a few years ago by a local philanthropist in the Greater Vancouver Food Bank to uh, basically take an idea for a social enterprise and and kind of roll with it and see if it if it had legs. And so uh, over the course of about two and a half years, starting with just kind of getting to a product launch in nine months, I launched Goodly Foods, which um, is now uh, a registered society uh, operating as a social enterprise in Vancouver that um, makes soups, stews, and sauces by repurposing um, surplus produce, so vegetables that would otherwise be headed to the landfill or compost, um, and in doing so creating unique employment opportunities. Um, uh, and so I kind of just put that up as a um, as an example that we can talk more about, but I just see what did I put next here. Oh. Um, um, you know, a few learnings from that um, and that's sort of what I'm seeing in the space and, you know, maybe others can share what, what they've seen that um, 
I think you spoke to this, Erwin, around sort of the, the, the slowness and the intention of the process is this is, you know, the path to kind of a, a money making social enterprise is not a quick fix. <laughs> it's, you know, it's a long process often, uh, no matter which way you start to under and which structure, and it can often be sort of in the five to seven year range to break even. Um, uh, from my experience and what I've seen that, you know, following sort of a lean startup and, and doing that, you know, what, what can you test quickly for, you know, the least amount of uh, overhead or, or, or investment um, and then learn from and understand the costs and the transactions and the benefits and how, you know, how your specific activities are maybe generating the impact that you thought and you, I think, Erin, you were just talking about that. Like, I know in starting Goodly, we did a, we ran a pilot um, and uh, just in, you know, let's just start with one soup, one recipe and see what we learn. And there's, you know, sort of invaluable learning by, by doing that start slow. Um, I always say sort of, I bring that business sense around starting with the beneficiary and I use the word beneficiary, but that's just because it kind of spans business and nonprofit to mean, you know, your customer, your buyer, your client, who, um, some people use the word guests in some, in some uh, places, but um, you need to really start with them. Who's going to be purchasing and who's the, transa the transaction going to be happening with, um, and, but also the product or the service, you know, with, with Goodly, I knew that if we had a soup that didn't taste good, we weren't going to get very far. <laughs> like you actually, you, you know, you have to, um, you still have to be starting with a quality product or service and, and really making sure that that is something that is adding value and bringing, you know, making a contribution to your beneficiaries. Um, a good reminder that often, you know, the scale of the social enterprises is interesting and there's a very, there's a lot that are very on the small end and that being really realistic about the num numbers around, um, it, it will often require investment and getting to a certain stage of growth or scale to be able to, to get to that break even or profit making if that's, you know, the path that you're, that you're aiming for. Um, and I think we've spoken to this about is sort of go slow with intention. Um, uh, for me, it's been really around leading from articulated principles, which I'll talk to a little bit um, in a moment. Um, and I think you've uh, already spoke to a couple of examples around that, especially when we're talking about um, some of the, the cultural aims and restoration or remediation. It's sometimes we have to, we have to start from um, a different framework than traditional business or nonprofit to be able to kind of move forward in the way that we want. Um, I always say that begin as you intend to continue. Um, so, you know, if you, uh, that, and that's, I guess, another way of sometimes saying walk the, walk the talk. So if you, if you, you know, if you want to be um, speaking and participating or, um, or partnering with certain groups then you know, start out that way and make sure everyone's at the table. And again, I'm speaking here as sort of an outsider. So I'm not necessarily speaking particularly to, to, um, the, the, your, the case of the Wildbird Trust or the example, more just from my own um, uh, experiences and observations. Um, and before we get into sort of more of a dialogue question, just to give an uh, example, and you did speak, Erwin, you mentioned regenerative um, uh, uh, ways of working, uh, and that is a, an area that I've really been focused on, on looking at over the last seven years and kind of uh, using principles for regeneration as a way of moving, you know, to what I see as sort of the future of business, whether it be social enterprise, nonprofits, or for-profit. Um, so these are just examples of what does it mean to be working from regenerative principles. Um, uh, and so for, for me, and this is from the Goodly example in the suit, in the suit business, um, uh, it was looking at working on evolving, always working on identifying what is the hole that I'm working on and what is the system I'm working on rather than focusing on the problems and trying to solve problems that are right in front of you. Um, uh, and then uh, the other piece for me is working with potential. Um, so really believing that both people are not fixed and again, not working to solve problems, but looking at like, what is the potential of the food, the people, your partners, the land that you're working on. Um, uh, and how can we sort of be, come, be becoming into that potential? Um, 
I like to work from essence or the uniqueness of, of so the no, um, you know, not working from a generic sort of cutting, like don't take uh, a cutout that worked somewhere else and just place it, you know, in, in what you're doing. So really work within, you know, in your place, you've got um, a unique piece of land um, and population and community around that, that, that area. And so, you know, working from uniqueness and also really tapping into what is the unique about um, the, the wild bird trust and how it came into being and how it's been contributing um, and, and move from that place. Um, and finally, definitely, well, maybe not finally, one of the other ones is that uh, working within nested systems. So always just keeping in mind that um, for change and evolution to, to happen, we can't just be working on, on you know, one piece of a system. And so that idea of the nested rings that we're, you know, we have to be talking at the individual level, the team level, the organization, the community, and then beyond. Um, and so always keeping those nested systems and those um, um, different aspects of working, but knowing that there's work to be done at all those levels. Evolution, so. Um, Maybe I'll pause there to see if there are any any questions um, before we have a uh, open up for a couple of the any questions or anything to add. I, I just add that you, I think the comment you made about regenerative economics is is instructive for us because I think it mod mirrors our decolonization aspirations. So I think that's. Um, I, th I think it's in its own self probably a workshop for our membership to understand how regenerative economics, socioeconomic uh, methods, all work in tandem with the mandate that the board has given the organization towards uh, redress and reconciliation with Slavitan in particular, and how regenerative uh, economics can play a part in that. Yeah, I agree. I, it is probably a whole workshop and more a lifetime of work on its own. But um, <laughs> I did want to drop it in here just because it feels um, to me that's the space that um, I like to to kind of be playing and, and speaking and talking about. So I didn't. I would be remiss given the nature of the work you're you're doing and um, the you know the, the the aims that I know you have to not speak about this. But um, yeah. So I don't know if there are any other questions specifically or comments, but we do have some dialogue questions that uh, the, the group might want to, to kind of get into a little bit more. Erin, are you seeing anything in the chat box or do you have anything else to add? Uh, no, I would just share that um, when, when you first opened the floor with the question about the flats, um, <clears throat> Shannon shared that for them, it plays a huge part in a non-coercive learning experience for children mm -hmm. and that's, that's a big deal for them um which is uh yeah that's an experience that i share there also um even in its uh the sort of heightened conservation agenda there is an opportunity for learning because my kids are young and want to just run wild all over the place and the sand of the beach and <laughs> disturbing the flora and fauna in a way that's not necessarily supportive of the conservation aims, but I um, wanted to share their the reflection there from Shannon's reflection about the the learning opportunities on the site. Um, and maybe before these specific questions about the beneficiaries, I have a question that's a bit more um, uh, for me, which is a bit more um, philosophical, I guess, as far as the nature of the role of an enterprise in the context of a conservation area. And this is around um, commercializing the site, let's say. And we're, we're talking about, um, we've talked about different possible locations for a nursery enterprise, either out at Dollarton Road or even across the road in Slavitooth's um, residential development that's in the works, uh, or having a more visible or increased footprint on the site, but I just wonder if anybody on the call has any um, ideas around if it, A, I guess the first question is if it's appropriate to increase um, the visibility and interaction of a commercial, in a commercial context with what's essentially 
uh, operated as public lands. Um, yeah, we 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 we, uh, we asked our landlords about that about two or three years ago specifically, um, and they are fine with uh, social enterprise activities and and the particular model um, of expanding the nursery operation um, and subsidizing our restoration goals through plant sales. So there, we checked in with our uh, our landlords and. and which is the District of North Vancouver, the Port of Vancouver, and um, Environment Canada. Uh, soon, soon to be slow to, uh, as of this morning, uh, Leanne and I were just on a call uh, with our landlords and the slow Nation for the first time in the history of the conservation area of 27 years will be invited onto the steering committee. So finally, after 27 years, there's some acknowledgement by the Crown of the uh, slow uh, right. So that's a small step forward. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, to answer your question, yeah, we're we're in we're in sync with our objectives. The the aspirations for, for example, a retail unit in the future Slotus development across the street should shouldn't necessarily be confused with um, nursery operations per se, but potentially could be a, a hybrid or some kind of a offshoot or further growth of the project. But we're we're not necessarily saying we'd be growing plants or having a, a plant operation over there, but potentially some kind of a frontispiece or welcome post for the public to, to kind of learn about the flats across the street and potentially have a, a retail booth or some type of a operation there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just wanted to give that context for the folks on the call who just said that they have an idea of the different the modes that we've been considering for the nursery. And I guess the piece that I'm wondering about specifically is um, does having uh, a store or a you know, the nursery's objectives have been primarily educational. We're looking at how to increase um, the revenue potential of the nursery to support the objectives of the Wild Bird Trust restoration, reconciliation, um, which, uh, which we all agree are worthy causes and that we're um, approaching this in the ways that uh, Alexa has described, I think, fairly well as far as beginning as we intend to continue and having as many people at the table as possible and asking these questions. I just wonder if it changes people's experience of a natural site um, to be encountering a commercial venture in that context. Does it make it less uh, welcoming for Slaywood Tooth community members or members of the general public who are coming to just be on the land? and feeling like maybe they're obligated or compelled to um, engage with a business uh, in that context. <laughs> Shannon's responded in the chat that, um, that they're sh he's sure their child would coerce them into engaging with the business. <laughs> Well, and maybe, I mean, Aaron, that's probably, I think one of the reasons why not, again, not being um, immersed like you all are in this project, um, but, you know, from my past experiences in trying to develop or decide on different activities or, or ideas um, um, is sort of where I came from the, with these questions. Oops, and I didn't know to, we've got resources later, but, um, you know, asking the question around who are the current or potential beneficiaries, so clients, customers, buyers um, of the nursery. So I guess that could include some of the people that are currently using the site now. Um, and then asking, you know, the question on how would the proposed nursery activities contribute to those people's lives or develop their capabilities to contribute to their families, communities, ecosystems. Um, and that might just be another way of coming at that question, Erin, that you were just posing, sort of, you know, like, how would that commercial thing, but rather sort of say, okay, so what's the nature of that activity and, and how would our beneficiaries be engaging with that? I don't think people are necessarily feeling like they have to buy plants, but I do think that having kind of the nursery right near the nature house and the entrance to the trail system brings a lot of people in who might not otherwise just sort of stop by a nursery because they wanted to go buy plants. But I think in terms of our educational outreach piece, it's important to have people who wouldn't have thought about native plants at all stopping in and hearing about it and 
maybe buying something, but that's not really the main, we're not tracking them down and making them, like forcing it down their throat, but if they are interested, they can stop by and interact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that would be, I think that's a good thing just for us to keep in mind going forward in our planning is that it's, that it's a parallel and optional piece as opposed to, you know, we're not getting like funneled through the gift shop at Science World. You have to go through the store in order to leave. <laughs> um, but make it easy. Um, yeah. Just okay. that kind of mode. I also am happy that um, just because there's some folks on the call who won't be aware, but we're also, um, there's a parallel project in, happening right now, which is establishing a demonstration garden as part of the, the site. So there'll be very much a, a public and 24 hour accessible um, educational interaction opportunity with the plants um, that will exist in parallel to any expansion of the nursery. So those feel like compatible uh, and sort of necessary synergies, I think. Yeah, and I would, I would add to that, uh, Aaron, that the other major parallel effort underway is the um, Habitat and Cultural Use Plan, which is an overarching decade, decades, uh, a visioning document for the next decade. And within that, we're dealing with the visitor experience. So the nursery actually is a fairly, is only one piece of that overall reconsideration of the visitor experience. And when, when we compare ourselves, for example, to the, to the rifle bird sanctuary in Ladner, you know, that entrance way and the fact that people pay, pay to get to enter and it's constrained and it closes at a certain time and there's days where the public isn't even accessing it, those are all on the table for us. So in five years, the visitor experience will actually be quite different and the nursery would only be one part of that. Just that there's not a ton of time left. Uh, I, uh, it's Kevin. Oh, go ahead. Great. Um, go ahead, Kevin. I was just wondering if we'd given up on the idea of the uh, old auto body concrete pad area uh, near the gravel parking lot. I mean, there was talk of that being a much larger sort of nursery for Wild Bird Trust. Yeah, and Leanne can update something from today on that. Well, um, I mean, it's currently a possible, we're working with Treaty Lands and Resources and potentially North Shore's Dreamkeepers around having some of that site reserved for log and boulder storage restoration materials. Um, so that's still underway, although currently the port has ensured that they have a uh, an existing space for their materials. Um, so it, 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 it depends on, it's definitely a site to consider if we need to expand, but I think if we have a higher priority for that site for, for reserving restoration materials, not just for offsite, but for our own restoration um, initiatives, then, then we should reserve it for that, but you know, given that, yeah, so that would be an evaluate, evaluated within the context of the nursery growth projects um, kind of needs um, in relation to our other needs. We could probably do both, I guess. It's pretty big area. Well, the, I will say that what I understand the volume of the boulders and the logs and the log um anyway the other part anyway the, the root system the wads logs wad um they can take up quite yeah. a lot of space um so um just uh i'm not sure if it would be compatible shall we say um, I see that Taylor has just joined us, who's um, on our board as well, is a landscape designer and is uh, playing a role in the design of the demonstration garden. Welcome, Taylor. 
Okay. So. But I think to Kevin's point, um, if it's if it's that site or if it's another site, um, part of this whole conversation that we're having is uh, increasing the capacity for propagation on site. So that's also what Kevin's pointing to. Alexa was just calling to attention that we're we're coming to the end of our uh, scheduled hour here and that there are some folks who might have other commitments or the end of an official lunch hour um, and I wonder if we if anybody wants to um, contribute I'm interested with the public's participation here today um, to hear Alexa are you able to go back to your last slide there I'm just, Buying up the final question, are there what are some unique features about how the Wild Bird Trust operates Maplewood Flats and interacts with the land and the stakeholders that we want to ensure are embedded in any social enterprise endeavor? So if there are any um, comments from the community of people who are gathered for this discussion today, that points that they people would like to make for us to keep front of front of mind as we're going forward with this. Um, with our nursery growth considerations. Uh, I would just add that, you know, it, and it's perhaps already touched upon, but ensuring that we're hiring local people where there's opportunities for employment, that any propagation is also um, accounting for any um, plant material that might have cultural or um, uh, historical uh, um, value um, to Tleototh, Squamish. Um, so th I would add some of those points. Okay. This, this might just be, it's not really my wheelhouse and I've learned a lot from your presentation. Thank you, Alexa. Um, just kind of want to throw this out there as a question in terms of developing as a social enterprise. Um, how, how would it change your, like the nursery operations, looking at it in this way? Because a lot of, I'm not, I don't know much about nursery operations, but from what I understand, it does a lot of this already. I, I'm not sure. Anybody want to? <laughs> yeah. Add on to that. Yeah, I don't know if it would change the operations per se. It's it's sort of the more of the behind the scenes, how it's structured, the principles that it's based on um, that may or may not differ from a strict business um, operation. It, there might be some benefits around being having a relationship to our charitable. So there's it's around some of your funding structure and how you govern yourself, like the regenerative, regenerative principles. I am personally interested in learning more about that. Um, so, I mean, generally we need to improve our business model <laughs> and some of our systems uh, so that we can increase our ability to get these plants out to the community and to the bigger um, customers, clients, our partners, um, so that so that they're more of these. Yeah, I think we said the the we the nursery was established and has been functioning as a social enterprise, as a small scale, small small scale volunteer <laughs> social enterprise to date, and that the fundamental objectives of the nursery wouldn't be changing per se. It would be it's more about what is. A scale that's appropriate for the organization and the site and given the opportunity um, and so how do we you know hang on to some of these original objectives um, and functions of the nursery and the all of the roles that it plays currently and how can we build on those in a way that's suitable I was thinking that um, answering or not answering perhaps asking more the second question about 
who are our like, beneficiaries or who are we sort of providing our goods and services to um, one question is how much of that is sort of the small scale people walking by on site versus how much we want to focus on larger projects. Um, my take on it is it's one of the key factors that's important to me is 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 sort of providing plants to the public and making people think about the possibility of regenerative ecological gardening and landscaping um, but we have talked about potentially also doing sort of larger um, orders or supporting restoration projects or stuff like that. I think it's possible for the enterprise to fulfill both of those roles. I kind of imagine there's a there's the public facing um, role of the nursery and then if we've got the this volunteer staffing support that in the background we can be handling the bigger projects or the longer term relationships um, as a way of uh, increasing the outreach of the, the mission of getting more native plants uh, back on the land as well as generating more revenues for the organization and objectives in that way. In terms of growth and like capacity, what Maddie mentioned with like supporting um, other restoration projects would be, which would be really great. Like what's our capacity right now for something like that? I think as Alexa pointed out, it's a multi-year process. She talked mm -hmm. about five to seven years. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, um, you know, when we, when we think of, we are working on uh, to, her, to her suggestion that we actually walk with intention and walk with practice. We are working on our institutional buyers program, you know, and specifically leveraging our relationship with the district of North Vancouver and getting a contract to, to do plant material for the new fire hall on Dollarton. Mm -hmm. uh, equally, uh, working with Slowatuth and the Economic Development Department at Slowatuth, who've given us a, a conditional uh, proposal to to provide Slowatuth developments with plant material. So those are um, gradual business models. Those are business models that we're walking, but that those would be, those would require larger systems. And I think that's where Aaron's role with our organization is critical: is to chart a path forward and take this information that Alex is uh, offering us in terms of the different models and then Aaron implementing some kind of a options, series of options and steps and timelines and, and investments that we'd require. Yeah, at this point our, our capacity um, is in flux, let's say on a weekly basis when it comes to volunteer availability for offering nursery services and it's been on a contractual availability as far as staff time contractor time like that and we're just taking on um as everyone's described the you know a few test um cases and relationships um kevin has provided the historic context that there historically there have been more restoration partners who patronize the nursery um in past years and so you know there's there's context for that um experience also that we can draw from and we just take it forward as we're able to in a way that doesn't um, detract from the other parallel programs and projects that are con already committed to or being committed to as we go. Thank you. Yeah, I'm learning a lot. Like I said, it's not really my wheelhouse, but I, I really appreciate the thoughtful nature of like a social enterprise idea. So yeah, thank you. I think also in terms of timing, if we are propagating some of the material ourselves, since we are talking about plants, there is going to be a several year lead time because they have to grow to the size that they're ready to be sold. So nothing is <laughs> instantaneously happening. Um, and we may be limited by our spatial constraints and our uh, capacity constraints in terms of how many projects we're able to get to and where how we're able to expand there
very excited though about the potential though. It seems like there's a lot here that we can work with. We're at five after one. Alexa, do you want to um, do a conclusion here if we, or I guess I'll ask the final, um, <laughs> give a final opportunity for input from, from the participants before we wrap up? And maybe I'll flip just for if they're for the recording and for the video, um, just to put up the resources so they're up for a minute at the end here. No, it sounds, I mean, I think what I'm hearing is that um, it's, it is always about, I don't really love the expression, what to like, what comes first, the chicken or the egg, but there's always this sort of, the, that slow growth and trying to test some new ideas and some projects. And it's like, you don't really quite have the capacity to fully say yes to a certain project, but you also don't know if you want to you know get the capacity to say yes to the full project until you've tested the project so you know it's sort of like how do you how do you how can you kind of um so i i you know i think the the idea of the you know plants take time to grow is an interesting one because it makes me think about you know sometimes at the beginning of these things you can't necessarily do all of the things yourself that maybe down the road you would be taking on yourself so how can you you know how can you look to partner or bring in other resources that might not be in the organization to be able to then like test the idea of of um, a certain activity or projects and I'm hearing that but it sounds like things are rolling and it does sound like there's some exciting movement so um, yeah I really appreciated the time and time to kind of get to know you all and the and the work that's going on and happy to support or have any chats after the fact about anything that we've chatted about today. Awesome. Well, thanks for your um, sharing your wisdom and expertise, Alexa. I know you said you're not expert, but you've been paying a lot of attention to it and giving so much of your life energy over the last years that and it, it comes through in the, <laughs> in the content here. So thanks for sharing with us today. Well, thank yeah, you. Yeah. Good luck on the journey. I'm up your day. On behalf of the board, Alexa, thanks very much. You, you definitely are an expert in it, and it would be great to uh, follow up with you, especially your experience in scaling up with, with Fiddly Foods. And I think scaling up is one of the business questions that our board will have. So we'd love to have your ongoing participation. Yeah. Wonderful. Happy to chat any time. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, everyone, for participating. I'm going to stop the Facebook. Great, I will. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy the rest of the sun today, everyone. Yeah.